Right, this morning, conference brothers, will sisters. now be recorded. Good morning. Welcome to our uh, Know What You Believe series. And today's lesson is on God. Last week, we talked about his word. Today, we're going to review a few discussion questions uh, from our lesson on uh, Know What You Believe about God. Uh, the Bible was last week, and then this week will be God. Did anybody have any discussion questions that you needed particular information about or that may have piqued your interest or that you were concerned about? All right, so let's look in some of these discussion questions then. I'm gonna ask them. If you wanna answer them, feel free. I'm just gonna pick two or three. Not gonna pick all of them. Not putting anybody on the spot. Uh, but I'll just pick a few. And if there are others that you wanted answered or that you didn't see when you went back to review, just let me know and we'll cover it together. So question one is, why do we all need the Bible? Why do we need the Bible? Well, it teaches us that um, God exists, um, that he's true to his character and where we came from and what our final destination and our all purpose. Right, right. Thank you, Sister Sylvia. When we say that the Bible is inspired, what do we mean? When we say the Bible is inspired, what do we mean? And, and we don't have to go into a detailed explanation about inspiration. What's the basic gist of it? Uh, basically, it's how God described. Um, it was inspired through the prophets. Um, um, yeah, he spoke directly to the prophets. So basically, um, what they were writing down is what how he wanted it to be spoken written and yes. spoken yes how he how he gave it to them they wrote it down the way he wanted it to be written and spoken the the word i want to give you to remember is that god breathed it out and they wrote it down god breathed it out they wrote it down um uh, question number five question number five uh, we talked about what our primary source of religious belief was. And then question number six uh, was, what are some questions that we could ask ourselves when we're trying to figure out a passage of scripture? What were some of those questions? Well, I, I actually had, um, you know, there's, you know, understanding various uh, scriptures and and the best source to interpret them uh, a lot of mm -hmm. times you can read it and you know you may have to read it a few times and you may understand the, the where the direction is going but to really dissect it you know what you know outside of the bible what else is available to be able to interpret it at its best point all right, so the first step you mentioned is I need to read it. I need to think about it. I need to look at the other scriptures and then I may use some other sources to help me understand it, like the book, Know What You Believe, or I'm gonna give you a good commentary to write down, a good commentary. And when you look at commentaries, you always have to look at what is the agenda of the of the commentary writer because the commentary is not scripture but what is the agenda of the commentary writer so you always want to use a commentary uh, where they believe that the bible is the word of god that it is inspired and that it is uh, uh inerrant it doesn't have any errors in it so a good one is the bible knowledge commentary the Bible Knowledge Commentary. And Roy Zuck, Z-U-C-K, is the, is the editor. 
John Walbert and, and Roy Zook, uh, Bible Knowledge Commentary. All right, let's turn then. Did, did, did anybody have any particular of those discussion questions that you may have struggled with? Um, remembering the Bible is liter it's literature, so there are literary forms. Sometimes there's figures of speech. Sometimes we need to look for application. Anybody have any other questions as you went through the discussion questions? Go ahead, Brother Trap. Um, it was uh, actually just one for um, question four from last week. You know, how would you explain the phrase canon of scripture, which, and to know that that was another term uh, for the Bible itself. Yeah, um, it is. Yes, sir. Yeah, and you we know the, the, to the canon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the fact that just the writing itself is so inspirational as as I read it to today. I mean, even just going through, you know, just some of the the readings that we're doing now, it's um, you know, it's just kind of more eye opening. Uh, yes, sir. In detail, as far as you know disciples and what they wrote and to to just to, to to be there in the first place and to be able to write the word coming from him himself i mean yes, I, I can't even imagine just being there yes sir and and you know the disciples at the time that some of these things were happening didn't appreciate the significance of all of it but after the resurrection when they were empowered with the holy spirit uh, they had a better understanding of what the Lord was doing when he was teaching them. Uh, let's talk. Chapter one is the Bible. Chapter two is about God. So I want to get into chapter two today and uh, go into um, what we believe about God. The Bible reveals who God is, but the scripture um, teaches us about God so we can know him personally. And what we believe about God, A.W. Tozer has said, is the most important thing about us. So let's talk a little bit about God and who he is, okay? Uh, when we talk about God, it doesn't really depend on what we think about him, what anyone else thinks about him. Here's what I mean. I was talking to a brother the other day. They were trying to move a piano from a basement that had flooded out of a house. And the brother told me that the reason they had such difficulty moving that piano is because that piano had fallen in love with gravity. What did he mean about, what did he mean by saying that the piano had fallen in love with gravity? It sounds like to me that it, it, it might have been pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was heavy. It was heavy. So does the existence of gravity depend on what I think about it? Say that no. again. Does the existence of gravity depend on what I think about it? No. No, because gravity exists whether I believe it does or not. If I jump, I'm coming down. If I throw an object up in the air, it's going to fall. And so the same is true of God. Even those who don't believe in him, sooner or later, will still have to deal with him because he exists and he is real. He, we learned last week that God reveals himself to us in four ways. One of those ways is creation. The second way is uh, history. The third way is through Jesus Christ himself. And the fourth way is through the Bible. Uh, we call the Bible, the creation, general revelation. We call scripture special revelation. 
And so uh, based upon this, we can learn about who God is. Uh, through his communication with us, we can learn about him. And so our personal concept of who God is, is worthless unless it's uh, coherent and coincides with his special revelation, which is the Bible. People will try to make God be who they want him to be and even draw him in their image. Uh, but the identity of God is not dependent upon our perception. It is dependent upon his revelation of himself. And his primary source of revelation for us today it's through Jesus Christ and his word, okay? Because God is a person, he has attributes and he has what we call natural attributes and moral attributes. So let's talk let's about talk. these two categories, natural attributes, moral attributes. God's natural attributes are what can be known about him from his nature, okay? And the first of these is that God is transcendent, which means he's above all. Uh, he's above all and is separate from his creation. He is not a created being, but he is exalted and eternal. And we use words to describe him like creator, sovereign, and judge. Isaiah 57, 15 talks about the fact that he's high and lofty and he is holy. And we'll talk more about his holiness in just a few minutes. So his, his attributes, the first natural attribute is that he is transcendent. The second one though, even though God is transcendent, he's also imminent. Imminent with an A in the middle means that God is near us and he is fully present uh, throughout creation, his presence and his power, okay? Uh, same scripture, Isaiah 57, 15, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. So even though God is transcendent, which means he's above all, he's also imminent because he's right here present with us. Uh, even now, okay? Transcendence and eminence, uh, but he is also omnipotent. Anybody know what that, what's omnipotent mean? All, all power, powerful. He's all powerful. Uh, um, God is not limited by anything except himself. Uh, he does have what we call uh, intrinsic self-limitations, which means that God limits his self. For instance, God cannot lie. Uh, um, and so throughout scripture, we see that God is all powerful. Not only is he all powerful, he's omnipresent. What does omnipresent mean? These are the three big O's we used to get from Sunday school. He's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. What is omn omnipresent? He he knows everything before it ever we ever thought about it. He knows it. Okay, that's omniscient. God is omniscient. He knows all. That's right. He knows all. And he knows all of the possible outcomes. Going back to omnipresent, he's all powerful. He knows all, he's omniscient. What's omnipresent? He's everywhere. I mix those up. Yeah, he's yeah. everywhere. Yeah, he's everywhere. He's right here. Everywhere. I want, yeah. Go ahead, Brother Tony. Simultaneously. Simultaneously. He's everywhere. Simultaneously. Simultaneously. And, 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 and you know, when you really think about that, just to know how powerful he is. How is that even possible? <laughs> that, I mean, that comes to mind, but you know yeah. that it is because of your belief. Yes, yes. Because he's God, he's able to be everywhere fully present at the same time. Uh, uh, and this is the key word, fully present. 
God is not like a substance. Like if I pour out some of this coffee, there'll be more coffee somewhere than somewhere else. But God is not thinned out by his expanse. He's fully present everywhere. Okay. He's a hundred percent everywhere he is. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> now I wish we I wish sometimes I could do that, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's omniscient. He knows all. Uh, Isaiah uh, chapter 46 verse uh, 10 says, and from the ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He knows all. Remember that when uh, uh, Jesus met the disciple uh, Nathaniel, he said before I met you, I saw you sitting under that tree and Nathaniel's mind was blown uh, because he hadn't seen Jesus, but Jesus had already seen him. He's omniscient. Um, he's eternal. What do we mean by eternal? Everlasting. He's everlasting. Yes, yes. Uh, when I do marriages, I always have People look at their ring. It doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an ending. Um, um, he never had a beginning, never had an ending. In fact, God exists outside of time. Time is something that he created for us. He's eternal. But he's also infinite. He's unlimited. Uh, he's not limited nor confined by the universe he created. And he is independent of finite things. He does choose to put limitations on himself, though. When Christ uh, comes, he wraps himself in human flesh, places himself in the womb of Mary. He put limitations on himself for our benefit. Uh, but he is infinite, okay? And then he is unchangeable, which means that he does not vary. He does not vary. He doesn't change. We are different people depending on how close we are to payday sometimes or what mood we're in or how we woke up and felt that morning. God does not change, okay? Uh, um, he's consistent. He's wholly consistent all the time. And then last, the last of his natural attributes is that God is personal. He is a person. And by a person, we don't mean a human being but we mean that he has all the qualities of a person, intellect, feelings, and will. That's really what defines person, intellect, feelings, and will. All right, any questions about the natural attributes of God? And I know this is kind of like drinking from the fire hydrant, but that's why you had a book, The Natural Attributes of God. All right. So let's let's uh, let's review. Uh, let's review his natural attributes are that he is transcendent, eminent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, eternal. He's infinite, unchangeable, and immutable. Those are the natural attributes of God, but we also speak of the moral attributes of God, the moral attributes of God. And there are three moral attributes of God. The first is his holiness. Holiness describes the sum total of the perfection of God. Holiness is his moral excellence and complete freedom from all limitations to God's moral perfection. And a lot of times you'll hear people say that holiness is the outshining of all that God is. Um, um, when the angels sing about God, they sing about his holiness, okay? Um, Holiness is the first of the three. The second one is love. Uh, even though God is holy and he is separate from all creation, 
uh, and he is perfect in his moral character. God is love. Um, and his love is a divine, perfect love. It is a sacrificial love that does what's best uh, for the object of his affection. God is love, okay? First Corinthians chapter 13 says, even if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm nothing. So in spite of how God may gift us, he wants us to reflect his character of love. Um, um, the third attribute of God, the third is that he is true. He is true, truth, okay? So if we look at all that God is, his moral attributes function this way. Justice, righteousness, and wrath fall under the category of his holiness, okay? Mercy, grace, patience, goodness, and faithfulness, those fall under the category of God's love. And wisdom, which is knowing how to operate in truth, that follows under truth, okay? So these give us some indication of God's personality, what God is like. And it also helps us understand to some degree our personality because God has made us in his image, which means that as people, we reflect some of who God is, okay? And we'll talk more about that later on, about how that reflection has been dimmed by sin. Uh, but these are the moral attributes of God. Any question about these three? Holiness, love, and truth. These are the moral attributes of God. They are how he functions. All right, moving on. <laughs> Stop me at any time. One of the keys of understanding uh, our faith is the Trinity or the triune God. And this is a concept that sometimes is difficult to understand, but the Trinity means uh, that God is one being, yet he exists in three modes or forms, each constituting a person, yet in such a way that the divine essence is holy in each person. So it's not that God is three persons separate, but one being, yet he exists in three distinct personalities, okay? Three, dis three personal self-distinctions within one essence. And I can give you a poor illustration of three in one. So if this were an egg and it's not, because if I go upstairs and grab any of them eggs and drop one, I'm gonna be in trouble. But if this was an egg, what are the three parts of an egg? The shell, the yolk. Shell, the yolk. What else? And that membrane. Yeah, what do we call that? What, the whites of the egg? I mean, that's what the I mean. Yeah. The whites of the, the white. egg, yeah. Egg white. So it's egg white, egg shell, and egg yolk. And egg yolk. All of those, are all of those egg? They make up an egg. They make up an egg. But we do we do we ever think of the shell of an egg separate from the other parts? Never. No, no. when an egg is formed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you all you know is <laughs> it's that's 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 the egg, <laughs> regardless the what egg. you call it. It's still right. yeah, three of three of one. Yeah, that's a perfect yeah, analogy. So, so that's. Oh, it's it, it it's a poor it's a poor analogy, but it does work. Actually, no, actually, it's not. Okay, all right, I'll take your word for it. So, if you think of the egg, the egg has three parts, but it is one thing. I didn't use coffee because coffee might have different substances in it. It might have coffee grounds, water, sugar, and cream. Those are different substances. But when you think of an egg, an egg has 
three parts, but those parts make up the egg. In the Trinity, there are three persons, but those three persons, three separate self distinctions with one divine essence, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all God, okay? Co-equal, but in subordinate relationships, okay? Let me give you some scriptures. Mark 1, 9 through 11, because here's what people will try to tell you, that the Trinity is not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible as a term, but it is in the Bible. It's all through the Bible. As a matter of fact, Mark 1, 9 through 11, Jesus came from Nazareth, Galilee to be baptized by John and immediately coming up from the water, the heavens parted and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. There came a voice from heaven saying, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. All three persons of the Trinity are present at the baptism of Jesus. The son who has submitted himself to the will of the father and the spirit that submits itself to the will of the son. All three are there present. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you and I'm with you always. All three persons of the Trinity present uh, with us, okay? Now, within the Trinity, there's a distinction of function, okay? There's a distinction of function. The Father sent the Son, to accomplish the work of redemption. The Father sent the Son to accomplish the work of redemption. The Son sent the Spirit to bring conviction to people's hearts and apply what Christ had accomplished. The old preacher would say it this way, the Father originates, the Son reveals, and the Spirit executes. Okay, the father originates, the son reveals uh, the will of the father and the spirit of God executes the will of the father and son. All three work together in our salvation and in our uh, what we call sanctification, which is us becoming more like Christ. Uh, any questions about the Trinity? All right. So the Trinity, there have been, because sometimes it's difficult for people to understand, there have been two major erroneous sets of belief or what we call heresies, okay? And some of these still show up today. One of these is called modalism. Modalism is a heresy or a false belief propagated by a guy named Sibelius. What Sibelius says is that the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit are three different manifestations of the one God that they are assumed or that God takes these different forms on temporarily to achieve his purposes, but the three never appear at one time, okay? So God in history may appear as God the Father. He may appear in history as God the Son. He may appear in history as God the Spirit, but that those three don't appear at the same time and they are not one. So for Sibelius, he thought that God in the Old Testament was God the Father, that God, while Christ was present on earth, was God the Son, and the Spirit and the Father didn't exist at the same time. And then when Christ is ascended and goes back to heaven, uh, according to Acts chapter one, then he comes back as the Spirit but that all three persons are not within the Godhead. That's the era of modalism, okay? Modalism, 
Now, this uh, uh, the, the, the era of modalism is what we already saw in the scripture, that all three are present at one time. They may have different functions, but they're all present at one time, okay? There's another era called Arianism, and this era has become more popular recently. In fact, I had to correct a friend who is now with the Lord. She has since died, um, uh, unfortunately, but she was teaching this to people, that the sun and the sphere are subordinate beings that the father willed into existence for the purpose of acting as his agents in uh, dealing with the world, but they're not God. Yeah. So Arianism says that the son and the spirit are subordinate spiritual beings. They're not God. Uh, and, and this is the belief even today of the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses and the Unitarians. They do not believe that Christ is God. They do not believe that the Holy Spirit is God. They believe that they are subordinate created beings, okay? Uh, the problem with this is that scripture refers to Christ as God and refers to the Holy Spirit as God. And you see both the Son and the Spirit act as, as equal partners or what we would call co-regents with the Father. They all function together on an equal footing within the Godhead, but they subordinate themselves, but that doesn't make them less than God, okay? Let me see if I can explain this a little bit. When I met Sylvia, I met Sylvia uh, as Pastor Waddles, okay? Uh, we sat down, we talked, we met in person, good to see you. Um, but when I get in my car and I drive to Chicago and I walk into my parents' house, I'm walking into their house as a son. So my father, even now, might ask me to get in the car, go to the store, pick up a prescription. And when I come back to his house, take out the trash. I'm like, dude, I don't even live here anymore. But in his mind, I'm his son. But when I come home to my house, I'm father, I'm husband. So I function in three different roles, but I'm still one person. And my functioning in those different roles does not lessen the person, okay? So Tony might be husband, father, uh, uh, boss. Uh, Computer tech. Computer tech, <laughs> praise the Lord, computer tech. But I, I can tell people. that's going to come in handy. <laughs> yes, sir, it is. And I'll talk to you more about that later. But that doesn't, that does not lessen those different roles that don't demean or lessen the person. Okay. All right. So these heresies about the Trinity, uh, it's important for us to know what people have believed that is wrong so that we can understand what is right, okay? So any questions about the nature of God or the Trinity? All right, well then let's talk about how God operates in his plan. So God's uh, eternal plan is spoken of by his decrees, decrees. And you hear a lot of people trying to use this word now, decreeing and declaring things. What we mean by the decreed will of God is the eternal plan by which God makes sure that all the events of the universe, past, present, and future, take place. Those are his decrees. God makes sure that the events of the universe take place. Those are decrees. That's God's decreed will. So God's will can be broken down into two parts. God's directive will is what he brings to pass. God's permissive will is what he allows to take place, okay? God's 
absolute decrees are always accomplished, but people may disobey God's purpose for his creature. Can you think of any example of God's directive will, what he brought to pass? Something that God made happen. I'm thinking in terms of biblical stories, anything that God made happen. Well, Mary conceiving by the Holy Spirit. Mary conceiving by the Holy Spirit. That's God's directive will, okay? What about, go ahead, Sylvia, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say, what about the flood when he destroyed the earth? The flood, that's God's directive will. Can we think of any examples of God's permissive will? Something that God allowed to take place. Life. Yes, but something that's outside of his directive will. God didn't make it happen, but he allowed it to happen. So I'm gonna give you a, an example. I'm gonna give you examples of both things in one story, okay? So when we go back to the book of Exodus, where are the children of Israel enslaved? Egypt. Egypt. They, are, they wind up in Egypt because of the famine that's in Canaan, in the land of, of Canaan, in Israel. They go to Egypt. They become a great nation there. They reproduce. And they live in the land of Goshen, and God blesses them. They come under the, uh, when Joseph dies, a new Pharaoh arises, and the people are put into bondage uh, and slavery because the Egyptians are worried about them taking over, okay? So God causes uh, uh, a series of sequences of events to take place to demonstrate that he is God. What were those 10 things called? Anybody remember Charlton Heston? Come on. Oh, the 10 commandments. Okay, he issues 10 commandments, yes. After they get out of Egypt, but while they are in Egypt, there are 10 plagues that come. Oh, oh, Remember right, those right, plagues? Right, yeah, right. yeah. So, so here's the deal. God lets the children of Israel, permissive will, go into slavery. When they are marching out in the book of Exodus, leaving Egypt after the 10 plagues have taken place, directive will. Slavery, permissive will. The 10 plagues, directive will. They get to a body of water called the Red Sea. When they get to the Red Sea, God tells Moses to stretch out his rod over the water and what's going to happen to the water when they get to the Red Sea. The water, what happens? It opens. It, yeah. it opens. And how do they get across? They walk through. They walk through. So directive will god splits open the red sea the children of israel cross on dry ground when the egyptians try to come through god's directive will causes the water to come back and the egyptians drown when you get to exodus chapter i think it's 14 as soon as they get on the other side of the red sea the people start complaining about where god has brought them from that's god's permiss permissive will they are ready to pick up stones to stone Moses and they want to go back to Egypt. They can't because the sea is closed. But but then God has, they, they start complaining about being thirsty and hungry. So God sends them water and God sends them manna from heaven and God sends quail for them to eat. Every day God feeds them, but the people complain. God's directive will, he split open the Red Sea. God's permissive will. He allowed the people to complain. God's directive will. He sends manna, quail, and water. God's permissive will. The people even complain about that. 
So God's will, his decrees are always accomplished, but he may allow people to disobey his purposes. That's his permissive will. But here's the key thing to remember. God is sovereign and he has the power to bring his divine decrees to success. Wisdom would dictate that we would cooperate with his will rather than fight against it. But people are not always wise. And so there's this concept called free will, okay? Now, the truth is human beings have what we call free will, but our free will operates within prescribed boundaries. We don't see them all the time until we run up against them. Okay, but our free will is usually a relative small part of a given circumstance. Okay, so I can choose and make choices within prescribed boundaries. So if we think about ourselves, what are some things that we did not choose as relates to ourselves? What did we not choose? I'm looking at being brother Tony. We have something in common. What did we not choose? <laughs> uh -oh. I didn't choose my genetics. I didn't, I didn't choose to be bald and wear glasses. Uh... But when I did have hair, I could chill, I could choose what hairstyle I wore my hair in. Can't I can't choose the graying process, but I can choose how I wear my beard. Okay. Um, I'm built a certain kind of way. I didn't choose my build, but I can choose whether or not I I, I keep up my body and make it healthy. You see what I'm saying? So what are some things that we that we don't choose? Well, we didn't choose the color of our skin. So. Yeah. Our our ethnic background, we didn't choose that. Okay? But we can choose how we express our ethnicity. Okay? Um I didn't know in my family that there's a genetic disposition to a certain kind of arthritis that has plagued me my whole life until this year. I didn't know that all these different things were, were related to that one condition. I didn't choose that, but I can choose how I relate to that, okay? Yeah, you didn't, you didn't, <clears throat> we didn't choose our ancestors. We didn't choose our ancestors. We didn't choose what family we came from. So when we talk about free will and, and people get really hung up on free will, but it's not as big a deal as we think it is, okay? God does not choose to act because of our free will, okay? God knows what we will do in advance, but his knowledge of what we will do in advance does not limit what he does, okay? His sovereignty does not lessen our freedom or our privilege and responsibility to know and do his will. Because when I know better, I'll do better, okay? But God's sovereignty, his carrying out of his will is based upon his personality that he's trustworthy, loving, and all-knowing and knows what's best for us. Go ahead, Brother Tom. So... I mean, if you look at um, the sentence that says, you know, God foreknows your decision before you make them, but his foreknowledge does not in the slightest interfere with your complete freedom to act. So he already know what you planning to do before you even do it, but he doesn't stop you if it's right or wrong. Right. 
You can just shake your head to that. <laughs> yeah. See, within the confines of God's will is freedom of, of choice. My choices may not reflect his decreed will, but they don't stop his decreed will from taking place. Okay. Now, because God loves us, he provides us with his word to provide us with instruction in his spirit to provide us with direction. But our choice to follow him can describe which consequences or blessings we run into. Okay. Uh, um, so go ahead, Sylvia. I just wanted to make a comment. He might not stop us, but I do believe he talks to us because, you know, when you're about to do something wrong, you know, you're saying, I know I shouldn't do this, but you do it anyway. I, I think that's the Holy Spirit. That's God talking yes, to you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of the, what John chapter uh, uh, 16 teaches that the Spirit of God convicts us when we're doing wrong and he guides us into doing what's right. So that we so that we don't damage ourselves, um, um, but that's that's how the will of God operates. Okay, so just to review real quick, I don't want to keep y'all too long because we have to transition to worship here. Uh, God's divine decrees. Oops. Uh, God's absolute decrees are always accomplished but God may allow people to disobey. His directive will is what he brings to pass, but his permissive will is what he takes place, okay? Now, here's what I'd like you to do for next week. Uh, I wanna give you two verses to remember, two verses, and I want you to build uh, a memory verse list. I want you to build a memory verse list. I want you to write Matthew 28, 19 through 20 down. Okay. This scripture talks about the purpose of the church, but it also talks about the Trinity. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. That's your one, that's one assignment. Okay. The second assignment is to cover your discussion questions and we'll go over them. If you run across anything in the discussion questions you don't understand, feel free to contact me or shoot me an email. Remember my email is pastor at sbcipsy.org, okay? And I'll put it in the chat real quick, pastor at sbcipsy.org. And that way, if you have a question, I can get right back to you, okay? All right. I want to encourage you to do one other thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you something that very few people have seen. I think Tony might have seen this before, but I, I used this illustration once before. And now I have hidden it from myself. I want to encourage you to keep a journal. This is my this is my journal. And what I do is I write down things in here that God is teaching me and God is that I'm learning from him. I also write down my prayers in here, what I'm praying about and praying for. Um, um, because as we grow, we need to reflect on what God has done in our life. And as we grow, sometimes we can look back and see better because we wrote it down. You know, there are things I prayed about that I forgot I prayed about that God has already answered. So if I'm keep if I'm keeping a record of it, I can go back and see what he did and when he did it. Okay. All right. Let's pray together. Any 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 special prayer requests? We talked about praying for the family of Paul Johnson, family of Lloyd Wafer, family of Pat Chandler, and the family of Melissa Roper. Uh, any other special prayer requests? Um, the Jones family and Steed family. The she Jones lost her daughter. He lost his son. My Lord, okay. Jones family and the Steed family? Yes. All right, all right. Any others? 
Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, this, this little book called Know What You Believe that is teaching us about you. We thank you, God, that you have saved us and made us a part of your family. And thank you for our brothers and sisters to whom we are connected all over the world. Um, God, we pray that your word will become alive and a fire in us. That it will not only touch our head, but our heart as well. It will not only move our mind, but it will inform our decisions and our passions. And then, God, we lift up to you our friends and family who've lost loved ones and who are uh, struggling with illness. Those, God, who are grieving, we ask you to wrap your arms around them of protection and provision. Give them your peace, God, and then bless everyone that's a part of this class. Uh, Lord, there are things we didn't mention that, that you already know about. And we ask you, God, to bless us in the way you see fit, that we might point others to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Y'all have a wonderful day. Now, listen, if you have tips or pointers for me on how this class is going or something you think I need to do differently, feel free to shoot me an email. Say, Pastor, could you do this or could you help us this way? Uh, I'm not the perfect teacher. I try to I try to be good at what I do, but sometimes I need to adjust to how other people learn. So help me with that if you would. All right. Thank God you. Bless you. God See bless you. All, you. all right. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome.